In this lesson, we are talking about Lynch syndrome. So we're going to talk about some of the pathophysiology as to why Lynch syndrome occurs. We're also going to talk about some of the cancers that can occur if an individual does have Lynch syndrome. And then we're going to talk about ways to diagnose it and ways to treat it. So Lynch syndrome is also known as hereditary non-polyposis colorectal cancer or HNPCC. Even though it's actually called hereditary non-polyposis colorectal cancer, it's actually a genetic condition involving increased risk of not only colorectal cancer, but also a variety of other cancers. And this is an autosomal dominant condition. So that means that you only need one copy of an affected allele, which is a version of a gene, to express or have this condition. And that also means that if an individual has it, they have a 50% chance that their children will also have it as well. Now, Lynch syndrome can actually be subdivided into two groups. One is HNPCC1 or Lynch syndrome type 1. This would be known as familial colorectal cancer. So this is going to be the type of Lynch syndrome where colon cancer is predominantly the only cancer that's going to occur in the family. And with this type, we're going to see earlier onset of site-specific colorectal cancer and an earlier age of onset of cancer. And in Lynch syndrome type 2, this is where we're actually going to see familial carcinomas or a group of cancers that can occur within the family. These don't have to only be colon cancer. They can be other types of cancer. And the way to remember these types of cancer or the more common cancers that can occur in this group is by the mnemonic CEO, C for colorectal cancer, E for endometrial cancer, and O for ovarian cancer, and then O for others. And we're going to talk about some of those other cancers later on in this lesson. Now, the epidemiology of Lynch syndrome shows us that individuals that have Lynch syndrome are at a very high risk of getting cancers in general. And oftentimes, they're going to occur earlier on in life compared to the general population. So the mean age of onset actually depends on the cancer, but it is a mean age of roughly 44 years old. And the lifetime risk of getting cancer in an individual that has Lynch syndrome is approximately 70 to 80%, so very, very high numbers. And it is estimated that individuals with Lynch syndrome have an up to 80% lifetime risk of getting colorectal cancer, and then a lifetime risk of up to 60% for getting endometrial cancer. And Lynch syndrome itself is estimated to account for roughly 2 to 5% of all cases of colorectal cancer and approximately 2.5% of cases of endometrial cancer. Now let's talk about the pathophysiology in Lynch syndrome. We talked about it being a genetic condition, an autosomal dominant condition, which means that it only requires one affected allele. And that affected allele is going to occur in DNA mismatch repair proteins. So it's due to defects in these DNA mismatch repair proteins. So what are some of the affected DNA mismatch repair proteins in Lynch syndrome and what do they actually do? So throughout the course of your life, there can be many different things that can cause mutations in your DNA. And some of these can be things like normal cell division. So each time your cells divide, there can be a mismatch or a mistake in the DNA nucleotide sequence. And what these DNA mismatch repair proteins will do is that they will actually correct that mistake. Other things that can also cause issues in your DNA or DNA mutations include smoking, alcohol use, and UV radiation. So each of these can all increase the likelihood of having some issue with the DNA. And what happens is DNA mismatch repair proteins will look and see the mistake and correct the mistake. So they are little editors of the DNA nucleotide sequence. So some of the proteins that actually are affected in Lynch syndrome include MSH2, MSH6, MLH1, and PMS2. So these are going to be the DNA mismatch repair proteins that are affected in Lynch syndrome. So when they are functioning normally, if there is a mistake that is found in the nucleotide sequence, these proteins will actually go and edit and correct that mistake. So if there's some issue with these proteins, it's going to cause issues in correcting the mistakes. So if, for instance, when a adenine nucleotide is supposed to be placed, but there's some other nucleotide that is placed instead, these proteins would normally correct that mistake. But because there are defects in these proteins in Lynch syndrome, we're going to have an increased likelihood of having mutations. So that 
wrong or mismatched nucleotide is going to stay. It's going to remain in the DNA. And each time this happens, more and more mutations can develop over time. This is why we see an increased risk of cancer in patients with Lynch syndrome. So those proteins, again, that are affected in Lynch syndrome are MSH2, MSH6, MLH1, and PMS2. So these are going to be important proteins to memorize when thinking about Lynch syndrome. And a way to remember them is that there are two MSH proteins, MSH2 and MSH6. I mean, you can think of this S as a 2. That might help you, and this S may help you remember that there are two of them. So we can think of it as an inverted 2. Then MLH1 is another protein that you're going to need to remember. And then PMS2, again, there's an S and there's a 2 in that protein as well. So hopefully that is a way to remember those proteins that are affected in Lynch syndrome. So what are some of the signs and symptoms of Lynch syndrome? So because we're going to see an increased risk of certain cancers in Lynch syndrome, we're going to see those cancers occurring and signs and symptoms that occur from those cancers. So by far the most common cancer that's going to occur in Lynch syndrome is colorectal cancer. And what's going to be noted in Lynch syndrome is that the right colon is going to be more likely to be affected than the left colon. And we're also going to note that there's going to be a high degree or a increased progression of adenomas to carcinomas in colorectal cancer. So for each adenoma that is formed, a cancer can be also formed as well. So a one-to-one. -one. This is in contrast to sporadic cases of colorectal cancer, where we see 30 to one adenoma to cancer progression ratio, which means that there often are going to be 30 adenomas formed for each cancer that is formed in sporadic cases. So there is a very high degree of cancer progression in Lynch syndrome. So because we're going to see oftentimes colorectal cancer in Lynch syndrome, we're going to see signs and symptoms of colorectal cancer. So these are all going to include the following, bowel habit changes. We can often see things like a pencil stool, especially if the left colon is affected. We can also see iron deficiency anemia. So because the cancer itself starts to bleed, patients can often note hematochesia, which is bright red blood parectum. And because they're losing blood, they can have iron deficiency anemia. They can also experience abdominal pain, weight loss, fatigue. And in some cases, if the rectum is involved, they can also see or experience rectal discomfort. So these are some of the signs and symptoms of colorectal cancer. And if you want more information on colorectal cancer, please check out my full lessons on those topics. Now, some of the other cancers that can occur in Lynch syndrome include endometrial cancer. We remember that we remember those cancers by the mnemonic CEO, so colorectal cancer, and then E for endometrial cancer. So endometrial cancer is another cancer that can occur in Lynch syndrome. So we can see signs and symptoms of endometrial cancer. So the endometrium is the lining within the uterus. And some of the signs of endometrial cancer are oftentimes going to be abnormal uterine or vaginal bleeding. So this is oftentimes going to occur in patients who have already undergone menopause and they start to have this abnormal uterine or vaginal bleeding. And this is oftentimes going to be a key finding when looking out for endometrial hyperplasia or endometrial cancer. And then ovarian cancer is also the other type of cancer that can occur with Lynch syndrome. So we can see signs and symptoms of ovarian cancer. These are going to include vague abdominal pain, ascites, weight loss, and fatigue. And then we also mentioned that there are other cancers that can occur in Lynch syndrome. And some of these other cancers are going to include the following. Gastric cancer, small bowel cancer, pancreatic cancer, biliary tract cancer, glioblastoma, sebaceous gland cancer, and keratoacanthomas. So by far the more common types of cancer are going to be the colorectal cancer and then endometrial cancer and ovarian cancer, but there are also increased risks of these other cancers as well. So it's also important to look out for potential signs and symptoms of these cancers when you see a family of individuals who have Lynch syndrome. So again, colorectal cancer, endometrial cancer, and ovarian cancer are going to be by far the more common types of cancer, but we can also see these other types of cancers at higher levels in patients who have Lynch syndrome as well. Now let's talk about how clinicians diagnose and investigate Lynch syndrome. So oftentimes there's going to be sets of criteria that can be used to help aid the clinician in either identifying a patient who has Lynch syndrome or identifying those patients that require further investigation. So one of those criteria is the Amsterdam Criteria 1. 
So this criteria involves having three members of the family with a definitive colorectal cancer diagnosis. So again, three family members. And there are two successive generations that are affected. So two consecutive generations that are affected. And then one of those patients is affected at a young age, before the age of 50. And one family member must be a first degree relative of the other two. And then with regards to the Amsterdam criteria, one, familial adenominous polyposis should also be excluded as well, which is also another inherited condition involving increased risk of colorectal cancer. And with the more recent and more updated Amsterdam criteria too, this criteria requires three members of the family with Lynch syndrome associated cancers. So three family members with some of those cancers we talked about in the previous slides with two successive generations affected. So again, two consecutive generations that are affected and one patient must be affected at a young age before the age of 50. And then one family member must be a first degree relative of the other two. And the same with this criteria, familial adenomatous polyposis must also be excluded as well. And these criteria, these two Amsterdam criteria, are oftentimes boiled down to the mnemonic 321. 321 meaning that three cancers, so it can either be three CRCs or three Lynch syndrome associated cancers, two generations that are affected in one premature, so one affected at a young age. And this essentially equals Lynch syndrome, but really it means that genetic testing is indicated. So this will really heighten the suspicion of the clinician to think that the patient has Lynch syndrome. And in oftentimes they may be diagnosed with Lynch syndrome based on these criteria, but oftentimes genetic testing is going to be indicated. So again, three, two, one, three cancers, two generations, and one premature. Now there's another set of guidelines that can be utilized for testing as well. So this is known as the Bethesda guidelines for testing, and I've adapted it here. So this is going to be another set of guidelines for further testing. So the first one is going to be a colorectal cancer diagnosis in patients less than 50 years old, a presence of associated Lynch syndrome cancer or tumor, a histology of CRC tumor indicative of microsatellite instability, which would be considered MSI, microsatellite instability, which is instability of a particular place or a particular nucleotide in the DNA sequence. So in the tumor histology, it would be MSIH in a patient less than 60 years old. The fourth point in the Bethesda guidelines is that a colorectal carcinoma diagnosis in a patient with at least one first or second degree family member who has a Lynch syndrome associated cancer diagnosed at less than 50 years old. And then the fifth is that there is a colorectal carcinoma diagnosed in a patient with at least two first or second degree family members who have Lynch syndrome associated cancers of any age. And so oftentimes these are going to be guidelines used to make a decision for further testing and more specifically further genetic testing to look out for an affected allele that is going to cause a defect in one or more of those DNA mismatch repair proteins we talked about earlier on in this lesson. So some of those testing again is going to be genetic testing. So this is going to be more of a definitive diagnosis for this condition. So again, those proteins, those DNA mismatch repair proteins that are going to be important to look out for are MSH2, MSH6, MLH1, and PMS2. And there can be large deletions in something called EPCAM that can also be indicated and looked out for as well in Lynch syndrome testing. Colorectal cancer testing for individuals who have Lynch syndrome is going to be a colonoscopy for screening, and it's going to occur much, much earlier on in life than the general population. And it's going to oftentimes occur annually. So oftentimes it's going to start at a very early age, as I mentioned before, 20 to 25, and in some cases even earlier than that, especially if there is a very early case of colorectal cancer in the family. So whatever the earliest colorectal cancer family case was, then the screening should start two to five years before that case. So if the earliest case was 20 years old, colonoscopy screening may be started at the age of 15 in some patients. With regards to testing for endometrial and ovarian cancer, pelvic exam and transvaginal ultrasound may be utilized and a CA-125 measurement may also be utilized on certain individual cases. And then other cancers can also be looked out for and tested for, and some of these can include upper endoscopy. We talked about gastric cancer being one of those cancers that can 
be at a higher risk in individuals with Lynch syndrome. And a urinalysis can also be utilized to screen for upper tract urothelial carcinomas that can occur in Lynch syndrome patients as well. And I don't know if I mentioned that earlier on when I talked about those list of cancers, but upper tract urothelial carcinomas can also be a cancer that can occur at higher levels in Lynch syndrome patients. And patients with Lynch syndrome, especially those with an MSH2 mutation, are at a very high risk of upper tract urothelial carcinoma. So that's also another important point to make note of as well. So how do clinicians treat Lynch syndrome? Oftentimes it's going to be lifestyle modification. So it's important to completely avoid some of those DNA damaging compounds that we talked about before. So complete avoidance of smoking and alcohol use. Sun and UV protection is also going to be important as well. And then diet and exercise. So preventing overweight and obesity. And there has also been some evidence showing that aspirin use, so long-term aspirin use, may actually be beneficial in reducing the risk of colorectal cancer in patients with Lynch syndrome as well. Now, oftentimes the mainstay of treatment is going to depend on the type of cancer. So oftentimes we're going to see a colonoscopy being performed annually as a screening methodology for patients with Lynch syndrome. And when finding a polyp, a polypectomy or removal of that polyp is going to be an important treatment methodology. If there is a cancer, there may require some segmental or partial colectomy or partial colonic resection. So removal of the part that has become cancerous. A total colectomy in some cases may be indicated, especially if there is widespread cancer. And with regards to endometrial and ovarian cancers, hysterectomy, which is a removal of the uterus with bilateral salpingectomy, which would be removal of the ovaries, may be required in the case of endometrial and ovarian cancer. And in some cases, this hysterectomy with BSO is going to be done prophylactically, but it's going to occur after the patient has gone through childbearing years. So again, this is also another important treatment to remove the risk of endometrial and ovarian cancer. And then depending on some of those other cancers we talked about before, other methods of treatment may be required as well, including surgery and chemotherapies. So if you want to learn more about other types of cancer, please check out my lessons on those topics. And if you haven't already, please like and subscribe for more lessons like this one. Thanks so much for watching and hope to see you next time.